everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Gabe uh, Kramer, who is going to uh, introduce his exciting project at 1000 Seward. And Gabe, perhaps if you could introduce your team. Sure, happy to. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone and, and um, Miguel and Alex and Diana for organizing this and allowing us uh, to present 1000 Seward before you today. Uh, with us is uh, Matt Cooper with the Post Group, who's going to give a quick introduction, uh, followed by uh, Matt Ollier uh, with Hawkins Brown, the architect on the project, uh, and Mick Unwin with Plus Development uh, will wrap up on some project details and answer any questions. Uh, so, uh, Miguel, if it works for you, we can just jump right into it. Uh, we, we have one item on the agenda, which is just uh, approval of the meeting minutes. Um, so allow us to uh, go through that and then we'll turn over the floor to you to uh, present 1000 Seward. Perfect. Um, I've read them, I'll, I'll move to approve. I've read them, I like them. Okay, can I have a second? I second. Okay, all in favor of approving the uh, unapproved minutes from the previous Plum Committee meeting, say aye. Aye. Um, aye. Opposed, say nay. Uh, any abstentions? Passes unanimously. Okay, Gabe, uh, we are ready to go. Awesome. Uh, Matt Cooper uh, of the Post Group, if you want to take it away, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, first, thank you, everybody, for uh, uh, affording us this opportunity to present. Thousand Sewer to you. Um, quick intro about us. Uh, I've been a uh, property owner, my brother and I, uh, in Hollywood for over 20 years now. And almost all of our property has been owner occupied. Uh, the various businesses that we've had in post-production, namely the Post Group, uh, Runway is another one. Uh, so it's all been us and our post-production business, along with uh, renting to writers and producers. So that's been our core core business for years. Uh, the last year or two, we started to look at broadening our horizons and developing uh, some of our properties to uh, benefit the entertainment community, which we're you know, very familiar with, obviously. And uh, so we were connected with the Plus Development folks. It's been a fantastic partnership for us. And uh, through them, we met the uh, internationally acclaimed Hawkins Brown Architects, uh, who are mostly active in Europe. Uh, I don't think this is their first project in the States, but I'll let them uh, you know, talk about them. And uh, that also has been a, a fantastic partnership for us as well. Um, I think that's pretty, much, that's pretty much the intro. So pass, okay. we'll pass on the baton. <laughs> pass on to the other Matt. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, as Matt mentioned, I'm next. My name is Matt Ollier from Hawkins Brown Architects, and I will share my screen. We've got a few slides just to walk through the proposals for 1000 Seward. Um, so bear with me whilst I just get that up. And can everyone yep. see the screen? Yep. Brilliant. Yes. Okay. So thanks for that intro, Matt. Um, as, as Matt mentioned, uh, Hawkins Brown, we're an international practice um, with offices in the UK, primarily in London, um, as well as offices here in Los Angeles. Um, we've been operating in LA now for about four years and um, Seward is not our first project here. We've completed a, a few other projects. We're working down at UC San Diego. Um, we are working for all three media. So we sort of have a familiarity with the media industry and the sort of creative industries here in, um, in Los Angeles. And Seward Street is kind of the next evolution of our experience and, and development here in, in the region. Um, Hawkins Brown, we're kind of a multi-disc practice. We cover a broad range of sectors from workplace, education, um, infrastructure. So we have a kind of broad skill set, but kind of commercial workplace projects is really our sweet spot, particularly here in, in LA. So with that said, um, I will delve into kind of the Seward Street specifics. Um, so you guys kind of know where we're talking about, I assume, um, 
but those of you who uh, don't, we are uh, on Seward Street, just south of Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, and you can see from the kind of aerial photo, the, the site is characterized by a mixture of um, commercial uses, a lot of surface parking lots, um, and some residential uses uh, to the east and the north. Um, and flicking on, there's sort of an immediate um, commercial context that we find ourselves in. Um, the Harlow is the, the newest development that has been finished opposite us on Seward Street. And then immediately to the north is the Harlow's parking garage, which is kind of separate from the Harlow as an independent above ground structure, five story structure. Um, and then to the north and to the east is the sort of two to four story residential multifamily developments. Um, and then around us, there's, as I said, a lot of surface parking. Our site is primarily surface parking with um, some of, of the post groups offices and restaurants as well. So they're kind of a mixture on the site. And um, so that is the, the context that we're looking to uh, design within. And, and it's that context that has influenced how we've approached the design. And so these kind of uh, quick sketches illustrate what we're trying to do. So we do not want to insert a sort of unified mass of building on the site. Um, we have a combination of below ground and above ground parking, uh, which I'll go on to in a minute. Um, but with that and the, and the FAR of 4.5 to 1 that we're looking to achieve, that would you know, equal about a seven storey mass of building. And across the whole site, we don't think that was appropriate. And so we started to articulate the mass to get greater height on the western side, on the Seward Street side, opposite the hollow, and then terrace fairly dramatically down towards the residential properties on the eastern side. Um, and so we've kind of ranged from 10 storeys its highest down to four storeys at its lowest. And then that, that mass has been broken into kind of three very distinct building elements that have been shifted upon each other, um, largely to create some public realm space at ground floor, which again, I'll, I'll dwell on in a minute. And then all of the, the interstitial spaces between those three elements are heavily planted um, providing that sort of visual relief as, as, as those decks are fully kind of landscaped and greened. So that's the sort of broad approach. And, and as a result, this is what the building uh, we hope will look like. Um, so a very kind of striking contemporary design, which is suitable for the ambitions of this neighborhood. Um, you'll notice the plaza, the public plaza at the ground floor on the Seward Remain corner, highly active by new retail and food and beverage uh, opportunities. There is actually a restaurant proposed on the 10th floor as well as the ground floor. So there are hospitality uses on multiple levels um, that obviously the public can enjoy. So it's not strictly a kind of ground floor only experience for the, for the neighborhood. Um, you'll see the Harlow opposite, a sort of four story heavily pitched roof building. So it's sort of looking to respond to that building scale. We're looking to try and disguise as much as we can the parking garage to the north, um, but understand the kind of need for parking in the area. So as I mentioned, we are including both above grade and below grade parking. And you can see the kind of terracing, the roof terraces we drop down towards the eastern side. This is a view from, um, from the south looking up Hudson Avenue. Um, again, you can see us responding in scale to the residential developments immediately across the street on Hudson. So that kind of ties into the four story multifamily development. Um, and what we're doing is looking to underground all of the currently above grade um, electrical poles and wires that currently kind of blight Remain Street. So all of that will uh, kind of huge expense to the project will be undergrounded and rerouted to kind of clear or clutter away from our development and kind of improve the overall neighborhood's character as a result. And then moving on to the facade treatment, again, we're looking to create a high quality product here in this neighborhood, the, the, the neighborhood demands it. And so we're looking at a, a really kind of elegant and contemporary use of metal, of kind of curtain wall glass. Um, at the ground floor, we're looking at precast concrete to create that kind of civic base that has a tactile and and great kind of aesthetic quality and define each individual component, the three elements I mentioned, through a varying pattern of fins and angled fenestration to sort of activate those facades. Um, 
And again, the kind of the, the roof terraces, heavily planted roof terraces, help to separate the building masses and, and break down the scale of the building appropriately. So a bit more detail about how the kind of organization of the building works. Um, the parking, the entrance of the parking will be to the north of the building on the Hudson side. So we're trying to avoid too much traffic along the narrow Seward Street and, and route it towards Hudson, Hudson Avenue. Uh, Hudson, as it hits Santa Monica Boulevard, there is, a, there is traffic lights at that point, so traffic can be easily controlled uh, and to improve flow as it, as it connects with Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, the ground floor parking is screened by some essential kind of mechanical rooms, but also screened by retail to the south. So we are avoiding as much inactive facades as possible. Um, so we are going four stories below ground with our parking and four stories above ground. So a sort of large proportion of our parking is actually buried beneath the building um, as best we can. And, and we're purposefully integrating parking within the building and not separating it out to avoid as, as much of an impact on that parking provision as possible. And just Matt, on, on that parking, we're at just over two per thousand, just over the code required parking, striped parking. Correct, correct. Um, so that's the parking. And then this is a mixed use building. So it's largely commercial office um, above ground. Um, so the commercial lobby and entrance is, is off Remain Street in the middle of the plan. So it's bringing activity kind of along Main Street and not just focusing it along the along the Seward side. And then rest, restaurant retail and food, you know, food and beverage functions then sort of make up the remainder of the ground floor uh, program. So we've got a number of restaurant and retail units on the Seward side um, with a large kind of outdoor dining space that is purposely set back well from, from the Seward Street sidewalk. And then further smaller community led businesses um, can occupy the southernmost retail that, that sits in front of the parking garage. And you can see there's a sort of large focus on the kind of pedestrian friendly landscape. I mentioned we're sort of moving and setting back heavily from Seward Street. This provides a brand new public plaza in front of the building. We've got these auditorium steps that provide opportunity for outdoor seating and dining for not only the building occupants of 1000 Seward, but also the other and um, public buildings in and around this area. Um, and then, you know, using high quality paving, high quality landscaping to create a kind of destination in itself. Uh, and this activates that whole streetscape. So this extends all the way down Remain Street. So there are very few blank facades on this building. Um, it's all activated by new commercial program. Uh, and that's the view at night. So it will be open beyond the kind of nine to five of the commercial office, providing activity throughout the day and the, and the night. Um, and the summary on the left hand side of what this kind of the key stats of the project. So we are achieving a 4.4 to 1 FAR, about 150,000 square feet. As I mentioned, commercial, largely commercial program with retail and restaurant uh, functions as well. In terms of massing, we are 10 stories above grade. So that sort of peaks at 155 feet to the very top of the plant enclosure. Um, 310 striped stalls, as Mick mentioned, uh, and significantly up to about three, you know, 34,000 square foot of open space and terracing to provide um, kind of visual amenity and activity throughout at all levels of the building. So at that point, I will pause. So thank you for the opportunity to present and. We welcome any questions, but I'll hand over to Mick Unwin, who's going to talk a bit about the process that we're in. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so as, uh, as we said, thanks very much for your time uh, and the opportunity to present today. We're definitely excited to be here. Um, so Mick Unwin with Plus Development and, and Chris Carlin's on the call as well, uh, one of the co-founders of Plus Development. Uh, we've actually just completed our office just down the road at 743 Seward. So I think it's about three blocks, or it is three blocks south of this site. And we're excited to be there as well. Um, so just give you a, a sort of a high level of where we're at in terms of the, the project, the entitlement, and sort of fast forwarding forward of, of where we plan to go live or when we plan to go live. Uh, so we are well underway with the EIR. Um, we've just completed the scoping session in early January. Um, we're targeting a draft EIR for mid to late summer. Um, obviously with the COVID impacts in the city 
um, sort of navigating that at the moment. But at the moment, we're generally on track for a mid to late summer uh, and expecting approvals or targeting pr approvals for early uh, 22. Um, in terms of the actual zoning and, and, and the planning um, standpoint, we are going through a GPA. Um, the, existing, uh, the existing zoning is um, medium density light manufacturing. Um, we're going to uh, M1 light manufacturing and also a height change as Matt just referred to. Um, in terms of construction, we have been working with CW Driver, um, a great contractor. They've been in business for, I think it's just over 101 years. They just ticked over. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of pre-construction activities with them. Um, and we're looking at about a 24 month construction schedule. So that puts us in, you know, going live at that 2024, early 2024. Um, a few things that have come up sort of in, in other conversations and we can, we can talk about this as well, but obviously COVID and offices, et cetera. Um, so we are mindful of that, but sort of being again, mindful that we are looking to come to market in that 2024 period. We're confident that uh, you know, staff and companies will want to go back to the office. We're already seeing that now. Um, and as Matt sort of alluded to, and we can dive into this in more detail, we've definitely designed with that in mind, um, you know, really looking at maximizing the outdoor spaces um, sort of some smart designs, wider corridors, touchless access control panels, um, sort of introducing air filtration system, things like that, just to make sure that, you know, when we build this, that, um, uh, you know, there's no concerns about future tenants. Um, we've also looked at, you know, it's great from a development standpoint, if you can land that anchor tenant, um, but we're also sort of mindful that that may not be the case. So we've designed it, uh, design flexibility in mind where we can have both a, a major single tenant, but also multiple smaller tenants that might come in and, and one half a floor or one or two floors, et cetera. So sort of keeping all that in mind. But as I said, that's very high level of where we're at and we're excited to be here and, and look forward to any, any questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty. <laughs> I, I have a quick question then. Um, so as you go up the stairs, is that, for the general public, for retail going up the stairs, or is that for the commercial office tenants? It's entirely open to the public, those stairs. So the idea is that we're giving back uh, a fairly large chunk of the property to the public. It'll be controlled by the development. It'll be private property, but open entirely to the public to use. That, that would that be, and then what about these decks? That would be more for the uh, uh, commercial tenants, right? Break breakout rooms. Correct. The, the the higher level roof terraces correspond to the, the commercial floors, so they will be private roof terraces for the tenants. Except for the the upper floor, the the tenth floor, where we uh, where we're proceeding with a we're looking for a, a restaurant, they have an outdoor terrace that obviously would be open to the public, David. Okay, so that would be another another retail. Correct. Yeah, that, that's a that's a food and beverage. Um, yeah. I think it's about five thousand square feet. I want to say, Matt. Uh, yeah. Like that. Yeah. So that would be a roof. Okay. A, ro a rooftop restaurant. Correct. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And and last question, and uh, I'm sure others will chime in. What do you think about security, and what? Do you plan to do, if any, for your own security to deal with how we've been dealing, you know, some some problems in the neighborhood? That's what the bid's been focusing on. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And as I said, we're actually just down the road at 743 Seward and, and uh, felt the full impact of, of that while we were working on uh, our building permits and having um, sort of break-ins in, in that property and, and having to station security guards outside the property. So I can completely appreciate the concern. Um, I think a few things on that one, you know, a good part about developing a site is, is you're activating the site. So as Matt said, we are, it'll be a, you know, theoretically a nine to five office building, but then we're also activating uh, restaurants on the lower and upper level. So it's, it's going to be sort of a fully active site. Um, from ownership standpoint, it would also be uh, a concierge on site 24 hours a day and on site security um, that would obviously patrol the site. Um, and then with the illumination, security cameras, and, and, and you know the like, that that's how we would look at addressing those concerns that, that you currently have. 
So you would you plan on having your own security staff? I noticed there was a lockers and a showers section there, but you you would you would have a full time staff for the property. Yeah, correct. I mean, the intent is to have, as I said, a concierge slash security that would sit there and obviously let people access during the day, but also uh, when the building is is closed down, that person would be there and, and be able to patrol the site uh, and monitor security cameras around the perimeter. Well, by 2024, uh, the place will be uh, perfect, so it won't be a problem. Even better, even better. <laughs> <laughs> no more homelessness, 2024. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I have a question. I understand that you're above the code required two per thousand ratio, but how did you analyze the parking uh, requirement or demand really from a, from a leasing standpoint? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, so we look at parking in a few different ways. Um, you know, we look at parking in a few different ways, I think. One is, is what's that code minimum that we obviously have to hit. Two is, is who are the occupants and the tenants and, and, and sort of who's coming to this site? Um, sort of are they, are they local residents? Are they driving here? There's also going through, as I'm sure you guys are aware, going through the secret process and understanding those traffic impacts and, and sort of making sure that we're not uh, creating a significant impact. Um, we're, we are also looking at, or can, we will be ultimately doing 100% valet. So mm -hmm. sort of you have a two per thousand stripe, but when you're valeting, you can obviously fit additional car cars in the parking lot. So the striped is two per thousand, but I think there would be room for additional, you know, for, for events potentially, if there was large events or anything like that, that we could accommodate additional cars. Got it. Do you have any stackers? About uh, the Harlow's garage next door and being able to work out a deal with them, or have you already had those conversations? Um, I know Matt Cooper has a relationship with them. I'm not sure if Matt, you could speak to this. I don't think we've had specific conversation with them, but again for events we would absolutely be up you know able to have those discussions for any high, I have, high volume I have, not, I have not had specific yeah. conversations with them about that yeah, yeah. In, in a, this is gabe sorry to jump in and it's a good question sam in a in a perfect world uh all of the parking would be shared and would be able to be as efficient as possible um but because of sequa and code parking and all that kind of fun stuff um there are on-site requirements for parking uh, that we have to hit for code. Uh, so uh, it, it, in the future and uh, ideally sharing parking with uh, that structure will be great, but there is just a, a, a level of parking that has to be required uh, and put on site uh, for this project. Yeah, and certainly one of the things that we always do within our projects that have retail um, you know, there, there's there's sort of code requirement, and then you know you you, you spoke to it um, make, in terms of functionality. That's kind of a different way to look at it, right? And the retail employees alone of these restaurants, if you got twelve thousand square feet of restaurants, that's not like five or six people working. That's a lot of people working. So where do those people go? Um, that's why I really asked the question about adjacent because three hundred and ten stalls is going to go like that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, as I said, it's a fair point. And, and, and we, we had a target of more, to be truly honest with you, specifically Matt Cooper. It's, it's sort of interesting because from, from my side, I'm always looking at the construction costs. Uh, well, it's part of the project, obviously, and looking at the construction costs and, and parking is expensive. Um, Matt was targeting more parking. Um, and as I said, I think that's where we can get to those higher, the two and a half or three per thousand on a valet option where they are actually stacking the parking as opposed to traditional uh, striped parking. But then there's also sort of, we, we need to get this through the city and the city is also sort of pushing for, for co-parking and, and not over parking um, sites. So it, it's sort of playing that fine line, um, to be honest with you. Sort of another question along the same lines. Is there like an Uber drop-off area or any sort of thought along those lines? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it would be along it would be along the, the front elevation there. Um, uh, I'm not sure, Matt, if you could go back to the floor plan, yeah. site plan. And that, yeah, so pretty much right there where that commercial entrance is. And that's being studied at the moment as, as a part of our EIR um, with, our, uh, with Gibson, our, our traffic consultant as well, where the best place is for that to be located. Mm -hmm. Is it just out of curiosity for, for our own input, is that Park parking something that that 
you guys are, are fighting, it sounds like? Is it just out of curiosity? I think this is more just driven by like, you know, tenant demand awareness. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's just, it's, it's tough to get by with less than three. Sure. Mm -hmm. Do you have the ability to put actual stacker units in your garage with your heights? Um, not as designed, no. Um, we're looking at that for other products, but not as designed. Um, I think we're slab to slab, is it eight and a half feet, Matt, maybe. Um, yeah. We did look at analysis, to be honest, of, of eliminating a slab, finding those construction costs, picking up a double height, and then you could put sort of a three car stacker and, and how that works. Um, but at the moment, we're not pursuing that. Tenants hate them anyway. Say that again? Tenants hate stackers anyway. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, ha have you submitted yet, or do you have a planner? Or if, if you haven't, when do you intend to? Yeah, so we're, we've, we've definitely submitted the, G uh, the GPA application, the initial study. We've gone through the scoping session. Um, so the project is in the public realm. Uh, we're currently preparing our draft AR. Uh, with uh, with our land use attorney Latham, oh, sorry Latham, uh, Mayor Brown uh, and Dudek, uh, uh, sorry Istone. I'm thinking of a different project and Istone, um, and we're looking to hit the streets with that draft EIR mid to late summer. Great. So have you been assigned a planner yet? We have, and I, I can't think of her name. Yes. Uh, Hi, this is Katie at Plus Development. Uh, it's uh, Kimberly Henry. Thank you. So you guys are not in the expedite unit at planning or are you? We are not, I don't believe. Okay. Why did, just curious, why did you choose not to be? Because that typically really helps I think, like this. I think the timeline was the same at the time of our submittal based on the expedite unit's caseload. Yeah. Oh, okay, got him. Mm -hmm. I believe this falls under Alex. I believe this falls under major projects instead of expedite. Um, yeah, they may not have been able. They, they may not. No, have they take them. them. Yeah. They take them. Yeah. I think this so is an amazing. There seems project. to be mixed reviews on the expedite process. Yeah. 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 Or mixed success, maybe is a better a, a better way to put it. But uh, yeah. Thanks, Katie. I think to your point, Alex, it can depend on the planner, and we were comfortable with the planner. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think it's an amazing project. My my comment also is like, yeah, like if you're looking to attract a tech tenant, like what Kilroy's done so successfully, they are, as like Aaron and others said, targeting like three to four spaces per thousand because the tech floor plates are quite dense. Mm. But that's the only comment um, I have. It's it's a great project. Definitely good for the area. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo what Alex is saying. I think it's a beautiful project. I think the design is stunning. Um, I think it's very kind to the neighborhood, the way that it addresses the street, um, the yeah. way this invites the public in. I think this is like the this is like the future of this district. It, it's the total opposite of what the history of media type businesses were, which were behind gated closed walls and totally inward facing in their own context. And this is the opposite. It's opening up, it's, it has ground floor retail, it's inviting people up to the top floor to a restaurant. And this is totally something that I think we should be in support of. So um, I definitely commend you for the work. And uh, are you gonna be coming back to present to us to ask for a support letter? Yeah, so I thought, Miguel, this was a good opportunity to, to give an informational uh, presentation. And once we really truly have all of our uh, answers uh, post uh, DEIR release, we would love to return uh, and achieve uh, this committee's and, and the bid's uh, overall support. So you don't, you don't feel you need the support letter at this point in the process, correct? Uh, personally, and I'll, I'll let Plus or, or uh, Matt jump in after, no. Um, I feel comfortable that, that we're moving along at a, a, a solid pace. Um, in terms of comments we have received um, and interest that we have received from others, it's been quite low. Um, I have 
never worked on a project with less uh, scoping comment letters uh, than this one. Uh, so, so far we are sailing. Um, the imp the, the uh, input we've received so far has been 99% positive. Uh, so we're excited to move forward. Um, I, I think we're on a good track and um, would be happy to return after uh, our EIR release to, to achieve your, your support. Yeah, I think I think when we get to that, those public the, the planning and, and, and council hearings, I think that'd be, you know, we would absolutely welcome your support at, at that stage. Um, so sort of towards the third, uh, fourth quarter, third, fourth quarter of the year, for sure, David. Yeah, yeah I think this this uh, board would be fully in support of it. It's a magnificently beautiful, it's a great design. And it is, as, as Miguel said, it's really I mean, probably the epitome and best expression of the direction of the community and the businesses here. So, I mean, I think it's fundamental to keep supporting these. Um, and you'll probably identify issues and there may be some community responses, particularly with the uh, uh, liquor licenses and the uh, restaurants that are going in and the, uh, there probably will be comment, but um, so far it looks like a brilliant project. Indeed. Uh, just a, I, I hope you're already working with DWP on underground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that is the vein of my existence, Miguel. <laughs> no, we're uh, so we're, it's a two part process. Um, one working with the underground division, which we have been, mm. I think it's got to be some 12 to 18 months we've been going through that process, but we, we are in the line for the underground conversion. Yeah. Uh, as Matt said, both the uh, the, the north-south lines that divide the site and the uh, the east-west lines that run at the front of the site. We're underground, mm -hmm. undergrounding that entire uh, run. Mm -hmm. And then also working with the new service division uh, and we are in queue with them as well. So no, pre appreciate appreciate that. And yeah, we are, we are we're working through that one. Yeah, we just finished the same process at Romaine and Sycamore and it took us okay. four years to underground the lines. Yeah. With, 34 or 5 group is very, very backed up. So yeah, no, they're busy. They're busy. Um, well, Can I ask a couple of questions on, uh, just a quick story that, that I don't want to drag down, but just a couple like nerdy, nerdy questions. Could we maybe go back to the, uh, the slide that shows uh, the plan uh, with the retail on it? Yes, this one here. Um, what's kind of the general macro vision of the 2,200 square feet of shop space off to the right there? Who, who do you anticipate um, attracting? What we, were, what we were designing this for is hopefully smaller, more boutique or kind of neighborhood scale venues. So it might be independent coffee shops or um, bike repair stores or anything that sort of doesn't need the footprint that, um, that you know, the larger units on the left might require. Um, so, you know, things that would support the commercial lines to people who nip down and grab a cup of coffee, this is about ideal kind of footprint for a small independent coffee vendor. That was the sort of intention of those smaller retail units. On the okay. Right. And I think I sort of a part of that as well was just addressing planning requirements of, of activating the street frontage sort of, you know, from a, from a layout standpoint, it would make a lot more sense for us to increase that, that valley area and, and, and take advantage of, of that. But um, sort of speaking, understanding what the planners want and, and, and want to see out of, out of that street frontage, we're trying to activate that, that street frontage. So um, uh, um, as part of the entitlements, we wanted to keep flexibility. So we made that space also food and beverage potential. So we, we can easily uh, adopt that if that becomes the best tenant mix. Okay. What is the what is the depth of that space? Yeah. I'm guessing it's probably it's pretty shallow. It's probably it's like about 20, it's about twenty like, feet. Okay, I was gonna say 20, 28 because it looks roughly like column the column, but anyway. Yeah, 20, um, 25 feet, I think. Okay. Um, and then the footprint of the restaurant space. It looks like obviously you've got sort of the primary street level restaurant space, and then a first floor sort of presence for the rooftop restaurant. What the ballpark square footage is there? So the oh, restaurant, so this splits into potentially two units. So the, the main restaurant here is about four and a half thousand square feet. Yeah. About two thousand square feet on the uh, the north. Of that so they can be independent, um, so they can be combined as a single. <clears throat> Got it. 
Although the, the rear one would still sort of be needed if for the rooftop restaurant, right? For them to get access. Okay. The elevator just there's various, to, uh, yeah, there's various space plans we've done, whether this is a sort of, um, you can carve this up to provide a smaller access point and lobby for the above, for the 10th floor restaurant, or this becomes a kind of extension of that as a sort of ground floor yeah. um, offering as mm -hmm. a, in conjunction with the 10th floor restaurant. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we have you notice on the commercial lobby, we created a VIP entrance also just in case we get certain tenants who want to have like a, maybe, the, maybe their talent agency or certain VIPs who want to enter through the back alleyway and come in through the main lobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. great. Um, um, actually, one other thing, I see refuse all the way off to the right. How did do, how does trash get handled? Uh, for the restaurant tenants. There's a sort of completely contiguous access route around the north of the building. And so we've set back so that you can trundle refuse uh, along the back and into the garage from that north side. That would I, be see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then last, sorry, one more question. Uh, what, what are the conversations with Rayos at this point? Is there interest on their part to come back or what's going to happen they are uh they've chosen to to uh relocate oh, okay. uh, as much as we would love to keep them we have a, we have a great relationship with them uh i'm hopeful that maybe they'll change their mind but i think that uh i don't think they want to wait during construction and then come back in yeah so, I, mean, I, I can totally understand that i mean what, yeah. why for two years me too so that's uh, right now that the plan is that they're going to relocate. So they are remaining there now, Matt, up until sort of breaking yeah. ground is the intent. Right. right. Yeah. So you've got whatever, 18 more months or whatever with them. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Cool. Okay, I think we need to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for coming and presenting. I encourage you to please return um, when you're ready to ask for a, a support letter um, and for to come and speak uh, in support of the project uh, in your public hearings as you go through the entitlements process. Appreciate Thank you very much Thanks for so your much. time and, yeah. uh, and your comments. Greatly appreciated. Absolutely. You're Thanks, welcome guys. to stay for the other agenda Thank items you. if you're interested. Sorry? You're, you are welcome to stay for the other agenda items oh. if you're interested, <laughs> but we won't be hurt if you drop off. Also. Okay. All right. No I'll worries. Thank you very much, everybody. Miguel, okay. I assume that we don't need to make a motion to approve it and about a letter yet, right? No, no, I don't think so. It sounds yeah. like we're still hammering some things out, so they'll come back to us and, and present when they get closer to uh, to um, their public hearing. Yeah, great project. Um, okay, the, the next item on the agenda is the upcoming... Uh, HCPU2 hearing on February 18th. Um, I included in the packet uh, for the meeting today an outline of uh, um, the, our, our, our comments in support of the HCPU2. Um, I thought we could distribute this to the board uh, in case anybody was interested in attending um, the CPC hearing. There is going to be a public comment uh, period, so um, you should have received it in your email from Diana. I will open it up on the screen in case anyone has any comments on the uh, on what I put together. On. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so um, I broke up the our comments into uh, really four sections: the FAR increase, um, the uh, continued promotion of media-related uses, which obviously we are in support of, as we are the media district bid the uh, revision to the zoning in order to allow more diverse uses throughout the district that support media industry and the CPIO. Um, starting with the FAR increase, um, 
what I was, uh, what I withdrew from the uh, comment letter was one that the FAR increase makes sense in this portion of Hollywood, um, as it is along a key transit corridor. Um, the district is dissected by a Metro rapid bus line on Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, obviously there's close proximity to the 101 freeway and some major corridors run through this, this area. Um, the second point uh, was that the lower density historically associated with this area um, was with the older type of the media industry, which was this area was dominated by single story manufacturing warehouses. Um, uh, uh, think of Mole Richardson, for example. Those types of industries have relocated for the past several decades from this area and the new type of businesses that are replacing them are still media industry, but they're less manufacturing and more so uh, computer centric uh, um, uh, types uh, type of businesses. So it makes sense to increase the FAR in this area to help promote the expansion of those types of businesses, which will ultimately result in job growth for the district. Uh, Miguel? Yeah. On this section, let me uh, interrupt on, on one point. Sure. You know, the, the problem is this Hollywood plan includes such diverse sections of the city that really don't even, shouldn't even be in the same plan. And what we heard at the yeah. open house last month uh, was that, or two months ago, was that, um, you know, there was a lot of residences and, and concerned about the impact on their on their housing and uh, and uh, affordable housing. A lot of things that don't really apply to us. I think yes. at this point, I think we need to point out that the existing zoning MR1, which covers a lot of it, and change to M1 is. Uh, significant in that it is not a residential neighborhood. It's right. an area. It's an area that focuses on job creation and everything that we are supporting in the plan that the city came planning department came up with is consistent with this being a commercial use zone. Decades ago, it was more warehouse and manufacturing, and today the commercial use is computers and offices, and that's what we're getting. And that's what this promotes. Yes. So that it has no intrusion. These changes that the planning department has suggested has no intrusion on other uses, on other parallel or adjacent uses. Because that's where I noticed in hearing the complaints to the things north of us, it had to do with how it was infringing on a lifestyle or a use that's already in existence. We do not. We're enhancing the current one. So just something maybe we could we could focus on in there. Like that's, that that's to your point too as well, Miguel. I love that comment. Yeah, I will add that. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, one perfect example is we heard a lot of people complaining about um, affordable housing, about developments that are replacing affordable housing. This is ob obviously these changes are going to have zero impact on housing. They wouldn't. They're, they're, they wouldn't. They're, 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 right. There, there is no uh, yuppified residential development that could occur in, yeah. in this bid. It's just right. It's not what it's for. That's not what it's addressing. Right. That's great. Okay, I will add that Thank to the uh, density section. Um, the second section is the promotion of uh, media related uses um, through the FAR bonus of being able to go to three uh, per thousand. Um, uh, you're only able to do that if you retain 0.7 FAR uh, and as dedicated to media related uses such as film, tape, television, video, internet, editing, music, and so on. So I think that secondly, um, in our comment letter, we pointed out that we fully supported the uh, promotion 
uh, and the retention of these uses, as it, this is what the district has historically been uh, primarily used for. I have a question about that. If you yeah. have an office building that's a three to one FAR and it's entirely leased to Netflix, does that, that totally satisfies it, right? You're not talking about actual points yeah. seven related to production or sound stages or, or editing, right? That would 100% work. Yeah. Uh, Jackson, the media uses is pretty all encompassing. Right. It's Netflix would be the, the prototypical one, but you could come up with many things downstream from a Netflix or a media, a, a traditional media company. Yeah, I mean, it could even it could be like a graphics company that makes a billboard for yeah. to promote yeah. media. We have tenants like that. Yeah, graphics companies are here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other thoughts or ideas on the on this section? Um, the third section. Uh, really focuses on the change from manufacturing restricted, uh, the MR to M zoning, which as you know, we're, we're all fully aware, the MR is extremely restrictive uh, zoning that hasn't historically allowed things like traditional retail, um, restaurant and uh, food services are difficult uh, because you need to get a conditional use permit to have those open to the public. And the Generally, the comment here is that the, uh, unlike in previous decades where you would go to a massive studio and the studio would have a commissary where you would eat on site, the modern day office workers, particularly those who work in the media industry, they want to have access to neighborhood amenities. So changing the zoning from the MR to M is gonna allow for uh, the district to um, encourage growth in neighborhoods serving retail, in restaurants, and other kind of amenities that, that people really want and can access on foot so that they're no longer getting in their car and driving over to West Hollywood or to other some, you know, some other part of the city uh, for lunch and then driving back. Um, so that's the main point of this section. Hey, Miguel, real quick, back to the three FAR. Is there a height limit there? Uh, the, the height limit is currently the MR is not restricted uh, by height. The I don't know what the change is when they change to M. That's a good, that's a good question. I don't remember seeing anything about a height restriction, at least not in the places that don't currently have a height restriction. Right. Currently, you're really restricted by FAR. Right. Um, uh, but that's a good. It's a good point, Jackson. I will look that up. Um, I mean, the, the last section, uh, the CPIO, it doesn't really impact um, much of the district. I think there's some very minor areas along uh, Highland, I believe, um, uh, where the CPIO and maybe Santa Monica where the CPIO uh, applies, which is really more addressing uh, primarily affordable housing um, and then design guidelines uh, in order to make the tree, uh, streetscape more attractive and uh, more pedestrian oriented. Um, this is probably less of an area we would focus on um, as it just it doesn't really impact much of our district. Um, any other ideas or comments or thoughts? Uh, Um, yeah, I guess uh, two comments. One, we don't need to really inundate them with comments because it's pretty non-controversial, okay? You don't need to put a spotlight on yourself to everyone else. Yes, right? agreed. Uh, right? This, this, is, this is, you know, we're saying we support 
what you guys have done. I mean, they did this. I mean, we may have, we yes. have urged that we have urged them twice on the zoning and the FAR and they took the last thing we uh, argued for by expanding the FAR increase up Highland to include those properties, the Eastman property, the Malik property. So they've been very cooperative. They've done everything we've asked them to do and this is their plan. So yes, we're really sir. just saying you guys are great. Right. Planning department is smart. They did this. Doesn't matter that we advocated for it. So I think we should have I don't think we need 10 people talking, you know, um, but maybe we need to strategically think. Uh, and maybe we ask uh, what's her name, Lauren Chang, how many people we really need yeah. talking about this um, to say we're going to what do we get? three minutes or two minutes maximum at, uh, you know, at CPC. So. Um, That's uh, a good point. This is a no brainer. This, this is not putting a, hot a hotel on a busy street north of a Hollywood Boulevard. This is all basic stuff that the planning department has bought into because I remember pitching it to them back in, you know, 2019. Yes. 2018. Agreed. So do we, I mean, we may want to think we do need to, you know, say we support it. So maybe Miguel, uh, when we talk about it at the board meeting, well, no, this is going to happen before the board. Maybe you think about a few people who would be good yourself and I don't know. And yourself. You yeah, we got new, new developer, Jackson, whatever. People just to say, we, we yeah. love you guys. You're so smart at the planning department. Right. And people can also uh, uh, attend and speak just as a as, as a, a property owner, owner. as a property owner. yeah I'm property owner. So maybe we need one one from the bid, and any property owner can can do their their thing. Yeah, great. I will. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll we'll discuss with Lauren offline then. Ahead yeah. Of um, okay, uh, we've got six minutes. Next item on the agenda, the 7-Eleven nuisance abatement proceeding, still no, still no movement there, no hearing set. Um, the parking meters in the 99 cent store, um, we're gonna have to touch base with the new um, council office staff. Um, I think we have a meeting set up. Are, they're coming to speak at our February board meeting. Is that right, Diana, the new councilwoman? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I think that would be a, a good time to, uh, after the introduction, um, uh, make contact with them and start working with them on these issues going forward. You know, I noticed that she sent out an email today announcing her new district managers and her field team for District 4. And I'm not exactly sure which of these people, but we should maybe, you know, Diana, figure out which one of those five people are the the field manager for us, and and have that person involved in all the things we do. Yeah. Maybe send our agendas, notice for meetings. I and I just received that too, and I will I will find out. I think it's Tabitha Yellows Yellows, Central Hollywood, Mid City, West Hollywood Hills. Yeah. And then this guy, Jeremy Tromers, has an interesting background. I mean, I would, you know, send them some stuff so they see what we're, we're doing and get them involved. Will do. Uh, any new business? Uh, hearing none, we'll adjourn at 3.56 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, buddy. Thank you.